Welcome to the first global webinar on Poland's mass market floral industry, which is brought to you by the Dutch Embassy of the Kingdom of the Netherlands, AIPH, and media partner Floriculture International magazine. My name is Tim Bryakiff, and I am Secretary General of AIPH, which is the International Association of Horticultural Producers. We are the world's champion for the power of plants. I'm speaking to you from the UK, and today's event is going to investigate how floral wholesalers and retailers can support each other in personalization, digital marketing, in-store experience, product discovery, point of sale, customer feedback, and customer and consumer analytics. Speakers coming to us from the Netherlands will promote uh, the circular agriculture approach that they have a look into stimulating floral sales of Dutch flowers and plants into Polish retailers. Polish speakers will provide a comprehensive overview of the retail landscape in Poland and at the same time the International Fresh Produce Association is going to give us some valuable insight into the current state and the future direction of mass market floral in the US. And first of all, let me touch on a few technical details. On the right hand of your screen, you're going to find an orange arrow. And if you click on that, you'll see a, a drop down uh, which will allow you to uh, amend your settings as, uh, as you wish. And you can also, you should also feel free to type in questions in the chat area um, and, and the question a, Q and a part. Uh, and you can do that throughout the session. We will collect them up and ask them for you later. We'll do our best to answer um, all of these questions during the round table session at the end of the webinar. Um, you can also find all the information about our guests today and their presentations in Polish and English in, in the handout section also, which is listed on that uh, box on, on your right. Um, as AIPH, uh, our role is to bring together the global ornamental horticulture industry. Our members are associations and organisations that represent the interest of ornamental horticulture producers in many countries around the world. We come together for congresses and events. We also publish the Floriculture International magazine. And I would encourage you to take up that free subscription and to keep up to date with the international news going on in our sector. Uh, we have a role in promoting the green city and in supporting our members on issues like novelty protection, sustainability, plant health. And we also have a role of approving international horticultural exhibitions, such as the Floriada, which is taking place at the moment in the Netherlands. So we're very pleased to be the publishers of FCI and to be able to bring an event like this to you to really help to develop the understanding of markets in different countries. And here we have the opportunity to focus on Poland. And we really appreciate the way we can work with the Netherlands Embassy in Poland to achieve this today. So we're coming to the end of what I'm gonna say. I'm going to welcome, first of all, our special guest of honor, who is Mrs. Paralien Spans. She is the Agricultural Councillor of the Embassy of the Netherlands in Warsaw, and she will be speaking from the Dutch Embassy in Warsaw. Uh, this is a, a beautiful building. I have been there myself, and it's uh, located in the, the lush green residential area near uh, Lazienski uh, Park. Uh, and the building designed by the Dutch architect, Eric van Egerat. Uh, it's won an award for a best contemporary design back in 2005. Interestingly, it's in the vicinity of the Dutch Garden, which was designed by Nick Rosen, who is the landscape designer who also has been so influential in the design of the Green City Arboretum that makes up uh, the, the, the main landscape within the AIPH approved at Floriada taking place in Almere in the Netherlands right now. So, Mrs. Spans will answer uh, the question as to why the Green City is gaining traction in Poland and why it's so important for flower and plant sales. 
and she's going to talk to us about the main challenges of doing business in Poland. So welcome, uh, Mrs. Spans, over to you. Thank you very much, Tim. And it's also very much a pleasure to do this webinar together with HIPH. Um, joining me here today, uh, who is helping me during the presentation, but you cannot see her at the moment, is Agnieszka Murawska. Uh, she is also working at our Dutch embassy and she is the export uh, in the floricultural sector. Uh, and as Tim said, my name is Caroline Spaans. I'm the agricultural counselor at the embassy, working here in Poland since 2019. And we are accredited for Poland, Czechia and Slovakia. And in our work, uh, what we do is promotion of the Dutch horticultural and floricultural sector, for example. And we do that also within the framework of our priorities, which were already as mentioned as well, uh, which is greening the city and sustainability. Uh, because greening the city is obviously very important also in view of climate change um, and to make cities more resilient uh, to warming as well in the summer. And I will share a bit more about our work environment, which is indeed very beautiful. I will share with you some examples of green initiatives that we are doing at our embassy. Uh, and I will tell you a few uh, bit about the trends and also about the risks uh, currently on the Polish market. So here you can see uh, indeed our beautiful uh, working environment at the Dutch embassy. Uh, it was uh, opened in 2004 and it was said it was designed by the Dutch Erik van Egeraad. And it was actually inspired by the 17th century uh, Dutch master builder, Tielman van Gameren, uh, who was already in the 17th century very active in Poland. And we have a beautiful garden uh, at our embassy because we like to give the right example, of course, but also have a pleasure working as well in the embassy. And since half a year, we have new colleagues at the embassy. You can see two cows there as well, uh, which we very much enjoy. And of course, there are tulips. Uh, but as was mentioned as well by Tim, we are very close to the Wajinki Park uh, in Warsaw, where we have the Dutch Garden. And the Dutch Garden was initiated in 2014, when our queen and king uh, came for a state visit to Poland. And the idea rose there to have a Dutch Garden in this Wajinki Park which is also very much connected to the Netherlands and to the 17th century uh, builder as well. And in 2016, the Dutch Garden was opened, which was during our presidency of, uh, of the European Union as well. And the whole Dutch Garden, it follows the symmetry as well of the, uh, of the platforms which are there as well in the Dutch Garden, in the, in the whole garden. Um, and it showcases a large variety of plants designed to, to create a contemporary look. And we made very much use of it as well during the COVID times, because when we were not allowed to work at the office, as most of you probably as well, we took the opportunity to have different walks and talks in the garden and show as well the beautiful Dutch garden to, uh, to our visitors or to our, uh, to our hosts as well. And uh, we also made use of it uh, about a year ago. We organized a workshop with a very famous photographer here in Poland. And she took beautiful pictures of our Dutch garden. And in September of last year, we had a beautiful exhibition at the gates of Wojenki Park. And for a whole month, there was the showcase of all the different varieties and all the different beauty of the Dutch garden. And also there, we made a promotion of greening the city of biodiversity in the city and of climate resilience as well in the city. But we take more initiatives than only this Dutch garden. Um, there are several initiatives that we as embassy are doing to promote the Dutch horticultural and floricultural sector in Poland. And as well, as I said, the priorities, especially of sustainability and of greening the city. And when we look at greening the city, one of the uh, initiatives that we have taken uh, is in Bratislava. Uh, it's the picture with the, with the two men we are, who are kneeling down and they are planting their tulips. Uh, but in the autumn of this year, we will also plant their climate trees, as we say. The mayor of Bratislava has taken the initiatives for 10,000 trees in his city. And as embassy, we have decided to contribute as well with some trees to to make the city of Bratislava more beautiful, but also more green and more climate resilient. 
And as green in the city, uh, we also have a look, of course, at Floriade. There is a small picture there which you can see, which is the uh, which is the exhibition of the Czech pavilion. Uh, here it's still being built, but obviously it has been finished by now. And the uh, Czech pavilion is there uh, to showcase also the growth market of the uh, of the Czech Republic. Uh, on October 1st, there will also be the Czech Day at the Floriade, and I really invite you to join there as well. Um, unfortunately, there is no Polish pavilion this time at the Floriade. However, next week, Agnieszka will go to the Floriade together with a delegation of, uh, of Polish cities who are very active in trying to see how they can green their own city. And at one point joining as well, not next week, but in the summer, is also the city of Katowice. And Katowice in Poland is joining as well because they will host the European Forest Championship uh, coming uh, summer on 26, 28 of August. And also the city of Łódź is expected there at the Floriade because they will host the horticultural exhibition in 2029. It's still far away, but preparations are already on the way. And those are some examples of where we can support and which might also provide opportunities for you, for the Dutch companies. Another thing we do as Dutch Embassy is we have the so-called tulip diplomacy. Uh, we use different varieties of tulips, of course, in our bi bilateral relations. And one of the important tulips is the Maciek tulip, which you see here. Uh, for some of you who might not know is that uh, Poland has been very active in helping uh, to liberate the Netherlands uh, at the end of the Second World War, especially the city of Breda, which, uh, where there was quite a lot of fighting and where the Polish soldiers helped liberate our country. While at the same time, of course, there was a war going on in their own country. So we are very grateful for the Polish soldiers. And that is why we still honor them uh, in this case with the uh, General Maciek tulip. We also have a tulip uh, in, uh, in Slovakia, which is the Slovensko tulip. And for example, when a new president is coming in, we always provide the tulips as well for the president to plant them, in this case, in her garden as well. And you can also see in the middle, there is an example of what we also did in Czechia. Uh, that is Grandparents' Day. Grandparents' Day is a new initiative, uh, at least for Czechia, and it is set on October 1st. And as Dutch Embassy, we provided support for two years to help the uh, Grandparents' Day to become really like a thing in Czechia itself. So we co-financed the, the Grandparents' Day so they would be able to organize, for example, workshops. And it's really about connecting different generations uh, especially during time of COVID, when loneliness was specifically a topic. And October 1st, as mentioned, will also be the Czech Day in the, at the Floriade. So Grandparents' Day will also be the focus during the Czech, Czech Day at the Floriade. And at the bottom uh, right, you can see the opening uh, of the Green is Life exhibition uh, that takes place every year in Warsaw at the beginning of September. And we are always there, of course, to support the whole floricultural sector, but also to support the Dutch company specifically. On the second day of the Green is Life exhibition, we always organize a networking event. It can either be at the residence or at a dinner, uh, dinner party, I would say, dinner working party. Uh, so we can gather there the Dutch companies, provide them with information and connect them to other stakeholders as well. And last year in September, we had a specific uh, treat there as well. Uh, you can see in the front of the stage, there were plants and we like to call them circular plants uh, because we use them not only to brighten up the opening of the exhibition, but we also use them later in different events. For example, during our circular week, which we organized here in Poland. And we use them there also to decorate our studio because we were hosting there from a studio and to also give them away later to specific participants of this circular week. So we try to reuse as well those plants uh, or the gifts that, that we have. And on the, on the right top, uh, there is part of a picture of an exhibition at the Royal Castle here in Warsaw. Uh, every year they also host a, ro a rose exhibition. 
uh, and we provide those kinds of specific events, for example, with speakers, uh, because there we can promote issues such as sustainability, and in this case, also the issue of invasive species. So we do that during different events, in this case, during uh, in Warsaw at the Royal Castle, but also during the upcoming European Florist Championship in August in Katowice, we will provide for a speaker. And we do this kind of activities to really promote the full sector and to promote our priorities in green, greening the city and the sustainability. So if there are Dutch companies also who are interested in, jo in joining these, of course, you're more than welcome to, uh, while keeping in mind those priorities and that we do it for the full sector. Um, and then a few things about the trends uh, currently in Poland. Um, I'm, we are mentioning there the fourth and fifth export markets because we are actually swapping places most of the time with Italy. Uh, so at the moment, Poland is the fifth export market for the Dutch companies. And that is quite big, I must say. Uh, and we swap places with, uh, with Italy, so we hope we will swap again to the fourth place. And Poland is actually still a growth market together with Czechia. Um, and it's the only two growth markets which are currently in Europe for the Dutch companies. So I'm very pleased that so many people are joining us today and also trying to make use of this growth. Because the advantages of Poland, obviously, is that it's pretty close by. Uh, it's 1,200 kilometers between Utrecht and Warsaw, uh, noticed by driving myself as well. And it's quite straightforward, obviously, also with the same EU regulations. And Poland, at the same time, is also really a hub for the whole of European, uh, for Central European Eastern countries as well. And the increase, the growth, we can really see uh, via the retail, uh, which is also what we will talk about today. And this is very much connected to, to the last point, that it's not only for special occasions, but that people are now buying flowers in Poland as well for their homes. Because it used to be really for special occasions, whether it's for very bright occasions, such as name days, birthdays, etc or maybe for more sad occasions, which is also the picture here, which is for All Saints Day on, on November 1st, which is very big in Poland. But now people are also buying the flowers actually for their homes to brighten up uh, their work environment, especially during COVID times. Because that was really when the awareness came that we would like to be surrounded by green. Um, and you could really see also during the Easter time, for example, it was very, very busy in all the retail and all the different kind of locations where plants were being sold. People are really working in the gardens again. Uh, but unfortunately, not everything is bright. These are the very bright uh, conditions uh, currently for Poland. Less bright at the moment, uh, there are two major risks. Uh, in Poland for doing business, or not really risk, but more the, the maybe the downward trends, which is inflation and connected to it as well is the war against Ukraine. Uh, the inflation in April in Poland was 12.6%, uh, which is really, really high. Uh, it was already high before the war against Ukraine on uh, February 24 started. Um, but now, of course, due with the war, more uncertainty has come on the market, more uncertainty for consumers. And you can see during recent polls is that the people in Poland uh, are more hesitant to spend a large sum of money or are able to spend a large sum of money of issues that are maybe not the first priority. Um, I saw this weekend a poll in Poland that 40% of people in Poland are not sure whether they will be able to go on holiday coming summer. And that 40% of the people are also uh, quite uncertain about the food security at the moment, uh, which is imaginable with what is happening. Um, so it's bringing some uncertainty uh, also for the flower market. Uh, at the same time, I want to mention that the Polish economy proved to be the most resilient in the EU during COVID times. And I'm more than confident that also this time the economy and the people of Poland will also be very much resilient. Uh, but I would like to reflect that these are the two um, risk or downward trends at the moment in Poland. Uh, and if you would like to have more information, because we provide a lot of market information also uh, on our website. For example, during COVID times, we also made a study about the impact of Corona on the cut flower producers here in Poland. All that kind of information and also on our activities, which we are organizing, uh, 
whether it's going to be the uh, European Forest uh, Championship as well in Katowice, for example, or the Greenest Life Exhibition, we post them all on our website. Uh, and if you keep track of that, you are sure you will not miss any of our activities. And uh, then hopefully we can also see you live here in Poland. So check on our website or send us an email to warnv.mimbuza.nl or follow us on Twitter. And uh, I will see you later during the panel discussion. And now back to Tim. So thank you very much for your uh, opening up the webinar for us today. And um, we will now it's time to go for our next guest. Our next guest is Mr. Domash Shekon of the of the retail consulting firm Retail Poland. Uh, he is going to provide a comprehensive overview of the Polish retail landscape, highlighting the discounters and the hypermarkets. He's going to explain why impulse sales work best uh, for discounters, while as a Dutch exporter, you can focus on a much broader product portfolio when dealing with hypermarkets. Uh, Mr. Shaikhorn is, is, was a little reluctant to speak in English, so we have pre-recorded his presentation and we've added English subtitles to it. Uh, so please can I ask Rene to uh, start the presentation of Mr. Thomas Shaikhorn. Thank you. Cześć, Tomek Szacon i to właśnie ja. Ja jestem osobą, która przybliża współpracę z sieciami handlowymi w Polsce. Od ponad 15 lat zajmuję się sieciami handlowymi, kiedy w Polsce ten kanał jeszcze raczkował. A od 2016 roku piszę na ten temat bloga. Mój blog jest dosyć popularny, pewnie dlatego też dostałem zaproszenie tutaj na to wystąpienie. Mój blog pod nazwą Retail Poland. Możesz na niego zajrzeć i zobaczyć informacje, które opisuję tam o specyfice polskiego handlu nowoczesnego. Drugą rzeczą, którą robię, to uzupełniam i aktualizuję listę wszystkich polskich sieci handlowych, nie tylko tych spożywczych, czy też tych DIY-owych, ale też opisuję tam sieci elektroniczne, drogerie, jak i również apteki i stacje paliw. Prowadzę taką listę nie tylko dlatego, żebyście wiedzieli, ile tych sieci handlowych w Polsce jest, ale też dlatego, że tam są kontakty do centrali kupców. Wszystkie telefony, które są na mojej stronie kanał nowoczesny.pl służą do tego, żeby zadzwonić bezpośrednio do centrali. Jeżeli jesteście z zagranicy, możecie też próbować dzwonić na te numery, ponieważ wielu kupców, wielu recepcjonistów świetnie mówi w obcych językach, w angielskim, czy też nawet w hiszpańskim, czy też w holenderskim. Próbujcie, korzystajcie z mojej listy, ona jest za darmo i zawsze będzie za darmo. Spotkaliśmy się tutaj po to, żeby pogadać o specyfice sprzedaży kwiatów, żywych, fajnych roślin, które no, trudno jest transportować i trudno jest przechowywać, ponieważ ich trwałość w tym czasie może się zmienić, ale też przechowywanie w innych warunkach niż te podczas produkcji, czyli w sklepach, w hipermarketach, w supermarketach, w dyskontach, może spowodować, że one troszeczkę stracą tej swojej jakości. Zastanawiając się nad tym, co dzisiaj do Was powiedzieć, a mogę gadać nawet przez 8 godzin, pomyślałem, że powiem Wam o dwóch największych kanałach sprzedaży w Polsce, w których jest największy trafik, czyli najwięcej ludzi przychodzi tam po zakupy i najczęściej przychodzą po te zakupy. W związku z tym sprzedaż kwiatów może być tam największa. W Polsce są to dwa kanały. Kanał dyskontów, czyli tam gdzie ludzie kupują spożywcze rzeczy, napoje, jedzenie i tam też sieci handlowe jako dodatek, dodatek sprzedają kwiaty. Oraz drugi kanał, kanał hipermarketów, czyli kanał wciąż popularny w Polsce. Miejsc, w którym jest dużo powierzchni, jest dużo miejsca, więc można je też zastawić kwiatami. Są tam alejki, czy też miejsca wydzielone zielone na kwiaty. To są Wasze dwie duże szanse na sprzedaż do polskich sieci handlowych. Oczywiście tych kanałów jest więcej, tylko że przez te 10-15 minut nie będę w stanie wszystkiego mówić, więc pomyślałem, że opowiem Wam o budowie i specyfice dwóch kanałów. Kanałów dyskontów i kanałów hipermarketów. Kanał dyskontów w Polsce, który mówimy jako pierwszy, zajmuje około 70% całej sprzedaży spożywczej FMCG w Polsce. W związku z tym najwięcej ludzi przychodzi w Polsce do dyskontów. Dlaczego? Ponieważ Polacy pokochali dyskonty. Podoba im się ten sposób robienia zakupów. Sposób, który jest prosty, kompaktowy, niewielki, mniejszy od hipermarketów, ale przez to zakupy trwają szybciej, jest mniejszy wybór, więc po prostu musisz przyjść szybko, wybrać to, co potrzebujesz i znikać. W związku z tym tam jest największe w Polsce prawdopodobieństwo, że może, może ktoś kupić od Ciebie kwiaty, no i często 
rozrodliwość tych zakupów jest duża, więc ilości będą o wiele, wiele większe. Jakie mamy w Polsce dyskonty? Największym polskim dyskontem jest sieć Biedronka, która ma 3150 dyskontów w 2020 roku. Na drugim miejscu jest sieć Dino, która ma aktualnie 1880 sklepów, ale rozwija się bardzo szybko. Nawet jeden dyskont otwiera dziennie, bo w tamtym roku otworzyli aż 360 dyskontów, przez co stają się drugą co do wielkości siecią dyskontową. Na trzecim miejscu jest Lidl z 810 sklepami. Na czwartym miejscu mamy sieć Netto, która przejęła sieć Tesco dwa lata temu i ma 380 dyskontów. I ostatni z nich jest Kaufland, który ma 235 dyskontów. W jaki sposób możesz Ty z zagranicy nawiązać kontakt z polskim dyskontem? Otóż e, wszystkie polskie dyskonty pracują przez magazyn centralny, więc wyliczając koszty współpracy musisz wziąć pod uwagę, że dostawa będzie zawsze do magazynu centralnego, nigdy do poszczególnych punktów, tylko zawsze Twoja ciężarówka jedzie do magazynu centralnego i tam się rozładowywuje. Więc obliczając cenę, którą zaproponujesz kupcowi, dąż do tego, żeby wyliczać ją do magazynu centralnego. Biedronka, tak jak powiedziałem, ma 16 cen dystrybucyjnych, 3 centa dystrybucyjne ma Kaufland, więc zawsze obliczaj cenę do magazynu centralnego. W Polsce nie jest łatwo wejść do dyskontów, nie jest łatwo sprzedawać tam towaru, ponieważ wszyscy wiedzą, że Polska jest krajem rozwijającym się, że non stop budują się nowe dyskonty, w związku z tym mniejsze kraje, takie jak Czechy, Słowacja, Litwa, Łotwa, Estonia czy też Holandia, Wszyscy chcą do tych polskich sieci pisać, w związku z czym kupcy są zawalani różnego rodzaju ofertami. Te oferty lądują często w śmietniku. Jeżeli chcesz się wyróżnić, to doradzam, żeby od razu podawać jakąś cenę do negocjacji. Możesz wejść na mój portal, kanał nowoczesny.pl, możesz zobaczyć tam, ile konkretnie punktów ma dana sieć, możesz dowiedzieć się, w którym miejscu ma ją magazyn centralny i wyliczyć mniej więcej, jaka cena mogłaby kupca zainteresować. Pamiętaj też o drugiej wskazówce. Dyskonty to nie jest miejsce, do którego ludzie przychodzą po kwiaty. To jest miejsce, do którego przychodzą po produkty spożywcze i mogą kupić kwiaty pod wpływem impulsu albo pod wpływem sytuacji, która aktualnie jest. Na przykład jest jakieś święto, w którym się kupuje kwiaty, jest jakiś czas, kiedy kwiaty powinny stać na, na stole, albo jest przypływ emocji pod wpływem wiosny, która przychodzi, więc każdy chciałby mieć coś takiego kwiecistego, świeżo, świeżutkiego na stole. To ten impuls powoduje, że ktoś kupuje kwiaty w dyskoncie. W związku z czym impuls ma odpowiednią cenę. Nie może to być drogi kwiat. Musi wziąć pod uwagę, że musi być to cena impulsowa. Impulsową ceną w Polsce jest cena 19,99 zł albo 9,99 zł. W związku z tym, jeżeli będziesz obliczał cenę i będziesz dawał propozycję kupcowi z dyskontu, pamiętaj o tych dwóch wskaźnikach i weź to pod uwagę, bo jak będziesz proponował jakąś szeroką gamę asortymentu, gdzie będą drogie rzeczy, to raczej on tego nie kupi i Twoja oferta wyląduje w koszu. A teraz druga kategoria, w której być może upatrujesz swojego sukcesu, która ma bardzo duży trafik, często przychodzą tam ludzie, to hipermarkety. Hipermarkety nadal są popularne w Polsce, z tego względu, że mają dobrą lokalizację, mają szeroki asortyment i można kupić w nich wszystko. Od powiedzmy produktu spożywczego, czyli mięsa, wędliny, mleka, aż po opony do samochodu i nawet wiertarki, wkrętarki, telewizory i pralki. W tym całym gąszczu hipermarkety mają także kwiaty i w ogóle całą alejkę związaną powiedzmy to z pielęgnacją domu, pielęgnacją ogrodu i powiedzmy to z żywymi ozdobami, którymi są przecież kwiaty. Hipermarkety już mają szerszą gamę asortymentową, więc nie musisz tam fokusować się pod wpływem impulsu do produktów impulsowych, ale możesz zaproponować szerszą gamę asortymentową. Jakie mamy hipermarkety w Polsce? Najwięcej punktów sprzedaży aktualnie w Polsce ma sieć Carrefour, która ma 935 punktów. Na drugim miejscu mamy sieć Intermarché z 220 punktami. Na trzecim miejscu mamy sieć Auchan, który niedawno przejął też sieć Real i łącznie mają teraz 108 punktów. A ostatni niewielką siecią, ale całkiem z dobrymi lokalizacjami jest sieć Leclerc, która na chwilę obecną ma 48 punktów. Punktów. W jaki sposób współpracować z hipermarketami w Polsce? Otóż hipermarkety będą trudniejszym partnerem do współpracy w Polsce z tego względu, że nie rozwijają się już tak szybko 
jak dyskonty. Dyskonty rozwijały się bardzo szybko, otwierają codziennie nowy jakiś punkt, w związku z tym brakuje im dostawców, w związku z tym upatruj tam swojej szansy. Natomiast hipermarkety mają w Polsce troszeczkę problem, ponieważ moda na zakupy w hipermarkecie zmienia się i to młodsze pokolenie woli dyskonty niż hipermarkety. W związku z czym hipermarkety nie otwierają tak dużo punktów, praktycznie kilka w ciągu roku. W związku z czym możesz mieć trudność z byciem kolejnym dostawcą, który być może nie będzie tak potrzebny jak w dyskontach, ale wciąż jest to fajny kanał i wciąż warto o niego dbać. Poza tym hipermarkety często są też franczyzą, tak jak w przypadku Carrefoura, w przypadku Intermarché, w przypadku Leclerc'a są to franczyzy, czyli poszczególne punkty mogą kupować bez zgody centrali. To ma swoje plusy i minusy. Minus jest taki, że musisz dogadać się z jednym punktem jeżeli chcesz pominąć centralę, czyli musiałbyś do jednego punktu sprzedać, a jeden punkt wiadomo, że nie kupi od Ciebie pełnego składu, pełnej ciężarówki. No ale dwa, trzy punkty być może taką ciężarówkę kupią, a często jest tak, że to właśnie franczyzobiorca ma 5-6 punktów Leclerc'a, czy punktów Intermarché, czy 5-6 Carrefour'ów, może kupować z centrali, czyli z magazynu centralnego, ale też Ty możesz sprzedać do takich 5-6 punktów jedną ciężarówkę czy dwie i już być dostawcą do pojedynczego takiego mniejszego przedsiębiorcy. Uważaj wtedy, jeżeli będziesz chciał rozwijać taki, taką sprzedaż, no to pamiętaj, że też musisz nie dość zrealizować wysyłki do jednego miejsca, to też ewentualnie windykować takie miejsce, czyli gdy Ci nie zapłaci, to będziesz musiał do takiego miejsca napisać, pojechać i prosić o płatność. Ma to swoje plusy i minusy, ale wciąż jest to całkiem duży kanał do współpracy. Pracy. Mamy też jeszcze jeden kanał sprzedaży kwiatów ozdobnych. Ten kanał możemy nazwać kanałem DIY, nazywamy go tak w Polsce. Ten kanał jest całkiem duży i ma bardzo szeroką półkę i tam głównie się jeździ po kwiaty. I w tym kanale w Polsce wyróżniamy największą sieć, teraz to sieć Brico Marche, która ma 171 punktów. Na drugim miejscu sieć Mrówkę, która ma 307 punktów, ale większość z nich jest punktami franczyzowymi. No i na trzecim miejscu dałbym egzekwo. Castorame, Leroy Merle i Obi, które mają podobne hale i często konkurują ze sobą tylko lokalizacją, ale są miejscami, które się bardzo dobrze reklamują, są bardzo dobrze rozpoznawalne i warto do nich jeździć. Współpraca z tymi sieciami wygląda podobnie jak z sieciami w FMCG hipermarketami. Można do nich zarówno sprzedawać przez centralę, jak i do poszczególnych punktów, ale niestety nie zdążę tego omówić dzisiaj. Jeżeli potrzebowałbyś pomocy w dotarciu do poszczególnych punktów, zapraszam Cię do kontaktu ze mną. Możesz do mnie napisać, ja z chęcią podpowiem Ci w jaki sposób skontaktować się z sieciami handlowymi w Polsce, podpowiem Ci też jak zorganizować dobrą ofertę i jakie dać ceny, żeby to było w Polsce opłacalne. Wiemy jakimi wskaźnikami posługują się kupcy, więc te wskaźniki możemy Ci podpowiedzieć. Natomiast od razu ostrzegam, nie jestem biegły w języku holenderskim i angielskim. Możemy posługiwać się tłumaczem lub próbować rozmawiać takim łamanym językiem, ale z dobrych rzeczy mogę powiedzieć, że mówię perfekcyjnie dobrze po polsku. Polski nie sprawia mi żadnych kłopotów. Wiele razy pomagałem firmom holenderskim w sprzedaży w Polsce. Pomagałem w sprzedaży pomidorów takich koktajlowych. Pomagałem też jednej firmie, która produkowała wyrzosy oraz jednej firmie, która na dużą skalę produkowała i sprzedawała chryzantemy. Więc jeżeli chciałbyś dowiedzieć się, które firmy potrafią importować w Polsce, a które potrzebują kupować tutaj na miejscu, chętnie Ci o tym opowiem. Zachęcam do kontaktu. Dziękuję za uwagę, dziękuję też wszystkim za zaproszenie. No i jesteśmy w kontakcie. Uh, she has just conducted a survey on behalf of the Dutch Chrysanthemum Foundation in Kreisel, looking at consumer behaviour and floral purchases at Polish supermarkets. And she's happy to give you some of the results at this webinar. So, welcome, Bridget, and over to you. Yeah, good afternoon. Thank you. So, my name is indeed Brigitte Hagen. I'm a growth marketeer at Concept Factory. Uh, Concept Factory is an organization specialized in the horticulture business. So we're working with a lot of different flowers and plants, but also other horticulture products like potatoes, for example. Uh, but today it's all about chrysanthemums and uh, how to get maximum out of uh, flower sales. 
So today I'm here to talk about the chrysanthemums and I do this on behalf of uh, all the Dutch chrysanthemum growers and all the Dutch chrysanthemum breeders. They combined forces uh, and together they have the mission to improve the market position of chrysanthemums. So they build a strong image and stimulate attractive consumer oriented product lines. And just before I go on, I want to notice that Friesen Foundation doesn't sell any chrysanthemum herself. So it's not a sales uh, organization. Uh, the foundation shares knowledge, experience and creativity. And we want to help Im to improve sales. So that's where it's all about. Uh, the Griesel Foundation uh, started already for some 20 years ago uh, and we started at the uh, most important export markets for chrysanthemums, that was uh, the United Kingdom and Germany and later on also uh, the Netherlands and France. And we see in these countries that the popularity of chrysanthemum is growing by over 10%. And more uh, interesting uh, for this uh, webinar is that we also see an increasing willingness to buy from supermarkets, uh, with supermarkets in United Kingdom, Germany, and also uh, the Netherlands. Uh, we uh, did some cases to see if we can improve the product lines on the shelf. And also here we see that uh, more and more consumers are willing to buy from the supermarkets the chrysanthemums. And today I would like to tell you our, uh, something more about our approach because uh, it's always a co-creation. So we work with the supermarkets, but also uh, always the exporter is involved and uh, also the uh, producers are involved. And we start with collecting market information because I think it's very important to know what consumers want, what they like, but also what they don't want, what they don't like. Uh, so we collect also all uh, consumer insights uh, concerning shopping behavior. And we are very aware of trends. So we spend also a lot of uh, time in seeing what's going around uh, about colors, about bouquet styles, uh, about trends, about sustainability, etc., etc. So we also, uh, combine trends with the market information we gather. And of course, we know what the Dutch chrysanthemum breeders and growers can offer. And we know what they have available. And not only what they have available now, but also what they can have available for the coming six months or for the next year. So that's a good starting point when you uh, select your product lines for the coming season. And we like to share everything we know with uh, partners, with retailers and exporters. Uh, so all the knowledge and experience concerning shopping behavior and market information about presentiments. And we also want to share our creativity because in our team, there are some really creative people who uh, have a lot of experience with uh, making commercial uh, bouquets with uh, presentiments. Uh, but we also hope that you want to share the information with us because I think in, uh, with co-creation we can get the best results. So we also need all the market information you have and the insights of shopper be shopping behavior that you have and also the things about culture, uh, very important to know. And then together we can create winning product lines. And sometimes... Um, uh, when we launch this, we listen and we learn that we can improve some uh, of these lines. So we always try to develop, uh, develop um, the lines. And in the end, uh, yeah, the result must be that there is a big sales success. And actually, and luckily, we have a good track record on that with the retailers we uh, cooperate with in uh, the United Kingdom and Germany. Uh, because in these countries, uh, Presentamin is really one of the most important product, products uh, in the category of flowers uh, because the chrysanthemums, uh, well, they have a lot of volume and a lot of color and you can use them in bouquets, but also for monolines. And it's a real strong flower with an excellent face life. So it really is a good value for money. And because there are so many chrysanthemums to choose uh, from, so with 
different colors, different, different flower shapes and different flower sizes, you can, uh, yeah, there are thousands and one possibilities to make good commercial bouquets fitting with your customers and uh, to seduce your customer every season. So that was about the countries, uh, Germany, UK, France, etc. But we also see uh, big opportunities in Poland. Uh, so that's why we already started with uh, some uh, activities together with a Polish PR agency and also together with some Polish florist organizations. And last year in 2021, uh, we conduct a store check in the supermarkets in Poland. So in uh, April, May, June 2021, we asked 250 Polish consumers to visit one of the uh, uh, supermarkets that you see on the screen. So 205 to 250 different uh, stores have been visited and uh, we get a lot of information from that. And I will share some with, uh, with you. Uh, we asked the consumers what's the association with chrysanthemum. And then we see that it's quite traditional. I heard it in the presentation before. Uh, it used that flowers were used for all selling today or for the grave, more the traditional uh, uh, special days. But we also see that there are more and more people uh, saying it's colorful, it's festival, it's spring. And uh, the funny thing is that 10 or 15 years ago in Germany and in United Kingdom and France, actually we have the same associations as what you see here. But now when we did a lot on product lines on uh, image building, we see that it has been changed. And now in the other countries, we see that people as associate chrysanthemums with its colorful, its abundant, abundant flowering. Uh, there are so many types. It's strong, cheerful, it has a long face life, and it's simply beautiful. So I think in Poland, it will go this way also, especially when we hear the younger generation, we see uh, that they are more and more uh, lost from the traditions and see the beauty, the beauty of the flower and the color of the flower like it is. So a lot of potential. Uh, I go back to the store uh, check. Uh, so we are back to the 200, 200, 250 visitors that went to supermarkets in Poland. And then we see that in 90% of all the visited supermarkets that they sell fresh flowers. Uh, so that's, uh, that's a lot. Uh, but if we ask, if we have a look at, uh, in how many supermarkets sell chrysanthemums, then it's less. It was only 24% in uh, April, May, June 2021 of all the visited stores that sell chrysanthemums. But if, you, if they sell chrysanthemums, then we see that uh, if we ask the consumers, if you see these chrysanthemums, are you willing to buy them? We see that almost 80% of all the uh, consumers is willing to buy chrysanthemums at this store. So I think there is really a huge opportunity uh, uh, with chrysanthemums also in the Polish supermarkets. Uh, and of course, I'm happy that almost 80% of the consumers uh, is willing to buy chrysanthemums, but I'm always curious, the 22% consumers that don't buy, what is the main reason? And then actually we see that the main reason was that there was a bad quality. So of course, this is an issue where we have to work on. The quality has to be okay, it has to be good. Uh, we asked what are the main buying criteria uh, to buy chrysanthemums in the supermarket. And then the reason to buy the chrysanthemums in the supermarkets, it's about color. Of course, it's about price but it's also about appearance. So the design or the chosen product has to be good. It has to fit with the consumer needs. We asked also for the product preference. Uh, then we see that 63% of the visitors, uh, of the consumers have a preference for mixed bouquets. 28% uh, have a preference for monolines. 
and 9% have a preference for mix of colors. And if we look to the price range, then we see uh, in the seven uh, supermarket change that has been visited, that the price range for the chrysanthemums are between 8 and 32 slotty. Uh, so keeping that in mind, uh, I think with chrysanthemums you can do a lot because people, they want a mixed bouquet uh, and with chrysanthemums you can mix a lot so you get the feeling of mixed bouquets within the price range that uh, are suitable. So I would like to give you some examples. Uh, like I said, normally it's tailor-made and we go uh, in, in contact with the retailer and the supplier uh, to see what works best for the, for the spe specific uh, retailer. But I will give you some uh, ideas of uh, the possibilities. Um, if you know that uh, consumers have a preference for bouquets and pay a lot of attention to the design, a simple thing is to mix up a mono line with some delicate flowers, for example, with a limonium, and then it really gets more and more the feeling of a bouquet, but even with simple ingredients, and you can stay within the price range uh, that is needed. Of course, you can mix the different uh, colors of chrysanthemums, uh, and you will have a good look of what will be a good um, uh, mix. But you can also vary, vary in um, uh, shapes of the chrysanthemums. So you can choose not only single head uh, chrysanthemums, but mix it up also with, for example, some pompon chrysanthemums. And then you more and more get the feeling of a, a mixed bouquet of chrysanthemums, still within the price range. And of course, you can play with sizes of chrysanthemums. So don't think only on uh, the spray chrysanthemums, but also Santini or the single-headed uh, chrysanthemums. So you can mix in, in sizes, you can mix in shapes, and you can mix in colors, and you really get the feeling of a mixed bouquet, but still a bouquet with a face life of at least 10 days. So good value for your consumers. Uh, so I think with chrysanthemums, there are many possibilities to fill uh, the shelf with, with different uh, price po uh, points from mono lines to mixed bouquets uh, or mixed chrysanthemums uh, uh, lines. Uh, if you want to know what kind of chrysanthemums are available from the Netherlands, we have a website, justchrystal.com, and there you can check out the current range of over 200 chrysanthemums. Uh, but like I said, we also know what will come in the future, so there's even more to choose uh, from. Uh, so to summarize, uh, we really would like to help you as a producer um, with uh, uh, making good designs, and it's not just designed for the big bouquets, but also which mono lines and which specific chrysanthemums you choose for your mono lines. Uh, because it helps to sell uh, the flowers uh, in the supermarket and in the end to have a happy customer because that's what we want, a happy customer buying a lot of flowers and for me personal, of course, uh, a lot of chrysanthemums. Uh, so I'm, yeah, I, I'm really open mind to, to talk with you about this in a personal meeting, so let's meet. Uh, my contacts uh, are on the screen. And also you can visit us every year in November on the trade fair Alsmeer. We do have a booth with all the chrysanthemum growers, the Just Chrysanthemum booth. So we can have a chat uh, over there as well. And uh, well, let's get the maximum out of flower sales with chrysanthemums together. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Bridget, for that. Um, I can see You've given us a lot of uh, food for thought regarding the buying criteria for chrysanthemums in supermarkets and give us a bit of an insight into that market in Poland and the product preferences, price ranges and so on. Now, um, keep your, well, please put the questions in the question area and I will put them to the panelists later on when we uh, have our round table session. But uh, our next guest is Mr. Robert Radkevich. Uh, Robert is a co-creator of 
Polish garden centres, and he will explain how Polish garden centres have been built on family business expertise and how they have evolved into a destination for plant lovers searching for quality innovation and the latest trends. Also, Mr. Radkovich, he wasn't so sure about uh, speaking his presentation in English. Uh, so, Rene, please, can you start the presentation, which gives us again the subtitles in English? Thank you, Rene. Dzień dobry, nazywam się Robert Radkiewicz. Od prawie 20 lat zajmuję się projektowaniem sklepów i centrów ogrodniczych w Polsce. Prowadzę szkolenia, jeśli chodzi o organizację sprzedaży w sklepach i w centrach ogrodniczych, jak również doradzam właścicielom sklepów ogrodniczych, tradycyjnym sklepom, ale i sklepom sieciowym, jak budować ekspozycję, jak organizować sprzedaż komplementarną i jak zarządzać odpowiednio sklepem i centrum ogrodniczym. W Polsce mam przyjemność współtworzyć już od, tak jak wspomniałem, kilkunastu lat sklepy ogrodnicze, które bardzo często tworzą się na podwalinach rodzinnych firm ogrodniczych, które to dostrzegają ogromny potencjał, jeśli chodzi o sprzedaż detaliczną, o sprzedaż roślin i akcesoriów ogrodniczych. I rzeczywiście można powiedzieć, że na tych przestrzeni kilkunastu lat branża ogrodnicza, ale i sklepy ogrodnicze, rodzinne sklepy ogrodnicze czy prywatne firmy dzisiaj to są bardzo, bardzo wyspecjalizowane punkty sprzedaży, dotarcia, jak również i promocji poszczególnych odmian roślin. To tam pojawia się klient, który jest bardzo wymagający, szuka nowości i szuka ich co sezon, to właśnie w sklepach i w centrach ogrodniczych w Polsce klienci doszukują się tego, co jest modne w danym okresie, jaka jest pora roku, jak powinniśmy urządzić swój ogród. Osobiście uważam też, że sklepy i centra ogrodnicze to są takim trochę przedłożeniem i, i takim jakby miejscem informacyjnym, co należy sadzić, co powinno pojawić się w ogrodzie, jakie rośliny sprzyjają poszczególnemu otoczeniu, jak łączyć rośliny, jak bawić się barwą, fakturą. To właśnie centrum ogrodnicze poprzez odpowiednią budowę ekspozycji, poprzez dobrze dobrany towar i asortyment pokazuje klientowi ostatecznemu, jak tą, co powinien kupić. Myślę sobie też, że sklepy ogrodnicze w tej chwili przeżywają ogromny, ogromny rozwój, ale nie tylko przez pandemię, którą mieliśmy, ale również przez to, że zasobność portfela potencjalnego klienta w sklepie ogrodniczym jest wyższa. W Polsce obserwuję na przestrzeni lat dużo większą sprzedaż roślin ogrodniczych, ale też bardzo dużo, dużo większą sprzedaż, jeśli chodzi o rośliny sezonowe, sezonowo zmienne, byliny, kwiaty, które nie były aż tak popularne i ta sprzedaż, skala sprzedaży nie była tak duża, jak jest obecnie. No spowodowane jest to kilkoma warunkami. No przede wszystkim mamy troszkę więcej pieniędzy, chcemy lepiej żyć, chcemy mieć piękniejsze otoczenie, zwracamy coraz większą uwagę na estetykę otoczenia i tego, jak funkcjonujemy. Dlatego każdy, kto szuka czegoś nowego, niekoniecznie pierwsze kroki kieruje do marketu, tylko właśnie idzie do centrum ogrodniczego, bo wie, że tam znajdzie produkt nowy, tam może znaleźć nowinki. Dużo więcej kupujemy bezpośrednio u producentów i holenderskich, i polskich. Zamawiając towar dowiadujemy się, co jest nowego, co możemy posadzić we własnym ogrodzie, co możemy czym możemy zaskoczyć swojego klienta. A wiadomo, że klient centrum ogrodniczego to bardzo wymagający i dobrze przygotowany klient i on wie, co jest ówcześnie, ówcześnie na rynku dostępne, jakie są nowe odmiany, jakie są trendy, jakie są mody, jakie są kolory i tego tak naprawdę szuka właśnie w centrum ogrodniczym. Patrząc tak zupełnie z boku, myślę, że sam rozwój sklepów i centrów ogrodniczych w Polsce to taki, bym powiedział, sam początek. To jest początek rozwoju sprzedaży takiej profesjonalnej, bo ta sprzedaż nadal się organizuje. Coraz lepiej potrafimy klienta niemalże zaczarować ekspozycją, ale jednocześnie też wywrzeć na nim takie wrażenie, że chce zostawić u nas więcej pieniędzy, tym samym też po prostu dokonuje większych zakupów. W związku z tym sklepy ogrodnicze rozbudowują się, 
Na przestrzeni ostatnich kilkunastu lat mam okazję tworzyć, współtworzyć, przebudowywać sklepy ogrodnicze, które w Polsce były tworzone 15-10 lat temu. One dzisiaj dostrzegają konieczność rozwoju swojej powierzchni, powierzchni ekspozycyjnej, rozbudowują hale handlowe, place do ekspozycji roślin, co tylko pokazuje na rozwój branży i na rozwój potencjału zakupowego. Tak naprawdę patrząc na różne branże inne, podobne, o podobnych załóżmy marżach, na jakich możemy pracować, bo zawsze gdzieś ten wątek ekonomiczny poruszam przy ustalaniu zatowarowania czy przy doradztwie, jeśli chodzi o odpowiednie grupy towarowe, które powinny się znaleźć w sklepie ogrodniczym, to można powiedzieć, że jesteśmy tutaj no, takim trochę liderem i każdy, kto prowadzi sklep ogrodniczy widzi, że ma ogromny potencjał i ma możliwości rozwojowe i inwestycyjne, żeby te sklepy swoje rozwijać. Świetnie, jeśli rzeczywiście właściciele dostrzegają tą możliwość rozwoju i też szkolenia, które mam okazję prowadzić w centrach ogrodniczych, pokazują, że widzą, że dzięki odpowiednio wyszkolonemu personelowi, który ma świadomość i wiedzę na temat roślin dostępnych w centrum ogrodniczym, ta sprzedaż jest coraz większa. I tu jest dużo, dużo jeszcze do zrobienia, jeśli chodzi o, o tą sferę właśnie dobrze przygotowanego personelu, który robi nam, można powiedzieć, 60-70% sprzedaży w sklepie ogrodniczym. Też wygląda to coraz lepiej, bo rzeczywiście mam tą przyjemność i, i to, że jestem też tutaj i mogę o tym opowiedzieć, to właśnie to, że dostrzegamy taką konieczność, żeby edukować, żeby mówić o tym, żeby mówić o tym, jak, jaki potencjał drzemie w sklepach ogrodniczych, które się nadal rozbudowują w Polsce. Nie spotkają się z żadnym sklepem ogrodniczym, który się zamyka albo ogranicza swoje, swoje, swój rozwój. Wręcz odwrotnie, każdy patrzy w przyszłość bardzo optymistycznie, każdy chce się rozwijać, każdy szuka nowości, nowości zakupowych, nowych odmian roślin, nowości rynkowych, tak? aby móc no niejako zaczarować swojego klienta, przyciągnąć go, zostawić u siebie w centrum ogrodniczym. A jednocześnie też myślę, że na przestrzeni ostatnich lat zdecydowanie możemy zaobserwować w sklepach ogrodniczych przywiązanie do marki. I tą markę budują znane, mniej znane, które się stają coraz bardziej znane sklepy ogrodnicze, przywiązując niejako klientów, którzy wracają po latach, wracają po 5, po 10 latach, przywiązują się do poszczególnego sklepu i tam właśnie robią zakupy. Tego brakuje w wielu sieciowych sklepach, dlatego że tam szukamy często towaru, kierując się tylko i wyłącznie ceną, szukamy produktu tańszego, produktu niekoniecznie dobrze wyprowadzonego, poprowadzonego, jeśli chodzi o jego wartość, estetykę i wygląd, a w sklepie ogrodniczym jednak spodziewamy się i już oczekujemy też od danego sklepu, że ta wartość tej rośliny, jej wygląd, pokrój, wybarwienie jest po prostu perfekcyjne. I myślę, że tego typu roślin coraz częściej będziemy szukać. Zadając sobie pytanie, czym kierujemy się jako osoby zarządzające, prowadzące sklepy i centra ogrodnicze, jeśli chodzi o zatowarowanie w materiał rośliny, to w sumie ciekawe pytanie i też ciekawa odpowiedź, dlatego że przez to, że dokonujemy zakupów indywidualnie, każdy sklep, każde centrum ogrodnicze praktycznie no, nie kieruje się żadnymi trendami, żadną modą, tylko takim indywidualnym podejściem do poszczególnego dostawcy, do poszczególnego materiału, kieruje się jego po prostu wyglądem. Bardzo często może przez to sam dokonać wyboru, jeśli chodzi o to, kto kto tak naprawdę jest jego dostawcą, kogo ma kupić materiał roślinny, co jest nowością. To on wyznacza trendy u siebie w sklepie ogrodniczym. Jest to ogromny też plus i sytuacja, która pokazuje, jaka jest różnica między robieniem zakupów przez sieci, przez wyspecjalizowanych kupców, a przez każde centrum indywidualnie prowadzone, gdzie właściciel ma wpływ bezpośrednio na to, co w danym sklepie się znajdzie. Ciekawą, ciekawostką jest też to, że bardzo często trudno nam jest dokonać wyborów zaopatrując sklep w rośliny, 
standardowy materiał roślinny, bo dla jednego coś, co jest standardem, dla drugiego jest towarem, którego zupełnie nie sprzedaje. Ciekawostką jest też to, że sklepy, typowe sklepy, centra ogrodnicze znajdujące się w mieście, w dużym mieście, robią zupełnie inne zakupy od szkółek czy sklepów ogrodniczych znajdujących się poza miastem. I tu jeśli chodzi i o wielkość tych roślin, ale jednocześnie też i o odmiany, o to jaki ma pokrój, jak jest dana roślina przygotowana do sprzedaży. Bardzo często rośliny, które kupują małe sklepy są mniejszych rozmiarów, ale nie ma też takiej zasady, dlatego że niektóre sklepy uważają, że lepiej dokonać wyborów i kupować duże rośliny, dobrze poprowadzone, rozrośnięte, bo, bo je po prostu widać i mają na nich większe marże i są w stanie na nich zarobić więcej. A z kolei inne sklepy podchodzą do tego w ten sposób, jeśli mają taką, często jest, te, jest taka sytuacja, że mają małą produkcję swoją ogrodniczą, wolą kupić mniejsze odmiany, mniejsze rośliny, które przesadzają, które kupują większe ilości i doprowadzają do tego, że ta roślina jest dłużej na placu handlowym, a jednocześnie też no, potem no, rozrasta się i osiąga lepszą sprzedaż, tym samym jest bardziej rentowna. Są bardzo, bardzo różne podejścia do organizacji w ogóle, jeśli chodzi o centrum ogrodnicze tej samej sprzedaży roślin. Dlatego, że w momencie, kiedy centrum ogrodnicze typowo powstało na przykład na podwalinach szkółki roślinnej, tam wiadomo, że właściciel chce te rośliny no niejako rozsadzać, przesadzać i osiągnąć większe rozmiary. W momencie, kiedy podchodzimy zupełnie biznesowo do poszczególnego do danego sklepu, wówczas tak naprawdę zależy nam na rotacji jak największej i myślę, że na tym tak naprawdę powinno też zależeć dystrybutorom i sprzedawcom, żeby te rośliny po prostu przyjeżdżały i wyjeżdżały. I chodzi tutaj bardziej o zapewnienie stałych dostaw, o rotację tych roślin, o to, żeby one na placu nie stały dłużej niż kilka, kilkanaście tygodni, o to, żeby była ciągłość w zamówieniach. Ale w takich sklepach bardzo często jesteśmy ograniczeni powierzchniowo. No i tu pojawia się często też problem taki, czy jesteśmy w stanie dostarczać ten towar w mniejszych partiach, ale regularnie i często, czy na przykład ten towar jednak jest też powtarzalny. No nie oszukujmy się, każdy klient przychodząc do centrum ogrodniczego spodziewa się wyrównanego i podobnego materiału do tej dostawy, która była wcześniej. A jest to problem, żeby można było zapewnić przy takich, bym powiedział, mniejszych partiach zamówień taki sam towar. Warto też sobie popatrzeć, jeśli chodzi o sprzedaż i współpracę ze sklepami ogrodniczymi, że ten mniejszy sklep, mimo że zamawia dużo mniejsze partie roślin, to zamawia ich dużo więcej, bo te dostawy powodują rzeczywiście większe koszty, jeśli chodzi o samą dostawę, ale potencjał takiego sklepu może się okazać często dużo większy niż tych wielkopowierzchniowych sklepów, które dysponują kilkoma tysiącami metrów. Często powtarzam też klientom, że nie chodzi o to, żeby mieć ogromną powierzchnię ekspozycyjną i ten towar tam ma stać i zalegać, tworzyć dekorację, która nie pracuje, bo lepiej mieć tak naprawdę mniejszy sklep, w którym rotacja produktów i roślin szczególnie jest, jest dostrzegalna i widać wtedy tak naprawdę w jakości, że te rośliny świeżo przyjeżdżają, świeżo wyprodukowane i w ciągu, tak jak powiedziałem, kilku dni opuszczają ten sklep i znowu pozwalamy sobie na zakup kolejnej partii roślin. Myślę, że takie podejście do typowej sprzedaży w sklepach ogrodniczych w Polsce jest jak najbardziej odpowiednie i każdy sklep powinien do tego dążyć. Nie zalegający towar, nie stojące partie roślin i innych akcesoriów ogrodniczych w sklepie, tylko właśnie świeże, regularne dostawy, które są odpowiednio przygotowane do tego, żeby je sprzedać. Dziękuję bardzo za uwagę. Do usłyszenia, do zobaczenia. Thank you for giving us uh, your valuable insights into the world of Polish garden centers. Uh, again, I remind you, please ask questions and we'll bring them up later on. Uh, we've now come to our last uh, speaker of today. Uh, and this is Mrs. Becky Roberts, Director of Floral at America's renowned International Fresh Produce Association. And in her presentation she will provide hands-on tips for retailers improving floral sales 
and a presentation and reducing shrink. So this is Robert's, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Okay, so we can get started now. I did want to just thank Tim for uh, sharing this time with me. I also wanted to thank Floral Culture International for inviting me to be a part of the panel. So let's get started. The fast pace of change and the threats of disruptions create tremendous opportunities. And that's certainly what the US market has been experiencing over the past two years. Once again, my name is Becky Roberts and I'm the Director of Floral at the International Fresh Produce Association, formerly the Produce Marketing Association. We've represented the supermarket floral channel for the past 30 to 40 years and look to continue with our new association, the International Fresh Produce Association. So let's take a look at what's been occurring in the US market within the floral department. Each year, our association has went out with a questionnaire to our floral buyers to find out exactly what's happening in the floral department and U.S. market. As you can see here, this past year, we have seen significant growth when we compare 2021 to 2020. Once again, we're seeing how we, the sales and increase in demand has impacted the floral department. Certainly. The intense demand has helped supermarkets here in the U.S. To, to decrease their shrink. And also, we are seeing the supermarkets struggle to maintain their inventory. We know <clears throat> that the floral professionals use many different points of information to help them plan and develop their strategies. They rely heavily on understanding what today's consumers want, when they want it, and what price they're gonna be willing to pay for it. And some of these things that are driving the information that they use to form their strategy is history. The US supermarkets all have their point of sales data that they're able to aggregate and then look and help plan. Quality. We know U.S. supermarkets are working with their vendors to always have top quality. Innovation. Supermarkets are looking to offer unique products at multiple price points and also to be able to develop their range of customer service. Flexibility. When you think about the U.S. market, there are many different regions that have multiple target audiences. So they have to be able to be flexible to bring the correct product at the right price to meet the, their needs and wants. Value. Supermarkets are able to offer multiple price points to really drive home that value proposition. And then last, premium offerings. And this is where supermarkets are looking to do those value added items. We know the U.S. Um, floral buyers all have challenges to really bring the correct products to market. And of course, these include a shortage of labor, increased transportation costs, even if they can get the uh, capacity to bring product to market, the consolidations of growers. There's a greater need for collaboration between retailers and their vendors. Right now, they're experiencing a tight market, and that's across all products, whether it's cut flowers, potted plants, or hard goods. And certainly, they are seeing the high, horrific cost increase across the entire supply chain to bring product to market. Just this past year, uh, IFPA conducted research. They surveyed US consumers in December of 2021 and January of 2020, 2022. And they, the, in order to be part of the survey, the consumer had to at least purchase a floral product at least once that year. And there were some interesting findings from this survey. People on average are purchasing flowers three times a year. 29% of those that were surveyed say they are always shopping for floral. 58% of those that were surveyed 
were motivated to purchase flowers due to the in-store display. We know in-store displays commonly inspire floral purchases. Merchandising through the displays are one of the key factors to help grow impulse purchases. Those motivations for planned purchases include someone requesting them or the shopper puts them on their grocery list. We know that those shoppers that have flowers on their grocery list buy flowers at least once a month or more. Supermarkets are a key purchase channel for flowers here in the U.S. Consumer bunches, bouquets, and bunches of roses are predominantly bought in supermarkets or grocery stores. For floral arrangements, consumers seem to also think about the florist shop as well as supermarkets when they're thinking about purchasing an arrangement. However, it's a very different story when we're looking at potted plants. U.S. consumers, when they want to purchase a potted plant, they think more of home improvement stores, garden centers, mass merchandisers are their main go-to places. So certainly this does give a great opportunity for supermarkets to think how they can capitalize on this segment. Bouquet and consumer bunches are impulse purchases more than any other product. And we know impulse purchases in general are due to the flowers or the plant that catches the consumer's eye in the store, or they decide that it would look very well in their home, or even that the plant or flowers really brought them some joy or happiness. Research has shown that consumer bunches and bouquets are purchased on impulse 28% of the time. Offering discounts help to grow additional floral sales across all channels, but most notably in supermarket and mass merchandisers. Offering more options is the next most important way to increase sales. To promote those impulse buys, have larger displays, and try to focus having floral products at the checkout. Here in the U.S., one out of four shoppers are reluctant to buy flowers from the online grocery or supermarket platform. In the U.S., we are concerned about inflation and the effect it may have on supermarket flower purchases. We are hearing consumers are expecting to spend less on their flower purchases due to the high cost of food prices that they see coming. We are beginning to see the dollar, si dollar sales rise why unit sales are not increasing at the same pace. And certainly here's clear evidence with this chart. The blue line is the percentage of dollar sales growth, and the orange line is the percentage of unit sales growth. And this is over the period of in 2021. So as you can see in April, May, and June of 2021, how prices rose significantly when compared to the earlier part of the year. So it'll be interesting to see how we proceed this summer of 2022. Typically pre-COVID here in the US, the summer months were relatively uh, a time of peace and quiet in the floral department, not as much growth and sales. However, in 2020 and 2020 and 2021, there was significant growth during the pandemic. So it'll be interesting to see how we proceed through the summer this year to see if the growth continues or will inflation have an impact. So as we continue to evolve in the post-pandemic world, the mass market here in the U.S. continues to capitalize on the growth and demand we've seen over the past two years. 
but they're also looking to find solutions that the many disruptions we've experienced through innovation, collaboration, and efficiencies across the US. So thank you everyone, and here's my information. Um, feel free to contact me at broberts at thefreshproduce.com. And back to you, Tim. Well, thank you very much, Becky, for uh, these insights into your market and the really uh, helpful research that you've been doing. So thank you for that um, today. Uh, we have been fortunate enough to have a very impressive lineup of speakers telling us about their experiences in the Polish global retail market, the trends, the most popular channels, buying criteria, bouquet composition, and consumer preferences. And the Dutch Agricultural Councillor rightly highlights how the green city movement is gaining traction in Poland and how the pandemic caused an influx of novice gardeners and how uh success, how to successfully do business in poland um and avoiding the, the pitfalls mr shakon has shown us that the polish retail landscape is predominantly uh focused on the discounters and the hypermarkets uh and at the same time mrs hargan has explained how polish retailers can increase their chrysanthemum sales and chrysanthemums are eye catchers providing volume and color and these year-round flowers have an excellent shelf life and are synonymous with good value for money. Well, thank you to garden centre expert, Mr. Radkiewicz. Uh, we, we now know much more about the Polish garden centre industry as a shopping destination for plant lovers looking for quality and the latest trends. The mass market floral industry is a horticultural powerhouse, but there is always room for improvement and and that's why it was so helpful to have the presentation from becky giving us several uh tips on how polish retailers potentially could improve floral sales and presentation and reduce shrink um we're going to move to some questions in just a moment but i just want to uh remind you if or inform you if you don't already know that there is the opportunity for dutch uh wholesalers traders to join a trade mission, online trade mission on the 23rd of June that we are running. And please do uh, visit Floriculture website, uh, our Floriculture International website, and you can see the details of how to register for that. Also with the support of the uh, embassy in the Netherlands, uh, in, uh, in Poland. And uh, please join that event to, uh, we'll directly connect you. With retailers the aim is to do this on the 23rd of june but if that's inconvenient we can potentially also set up other meetings on other dates as well directly with the retailers so please let us know anyway we only have a little bit of time left but i would like to invite uh, our panelists back if you wouldn't mind to come back and join me here now and uh, we just have some questions if uh, any in the audience have questions put them in if not don't yeah, we ha I have some here. So, uh, thank you for coming back and uh, joining us. I wonder, are we also going to be joined by our Polish contributors as well? Maybe Rene can see if they are going to join us as well. Uh, if not, we will. Well, we will make a, uh, a start with the. The questions here. I'm going to ask Bridget uh, first of all, and what what do you think are the barriers to growing the chrysanthemum market in hypermarkets in uh, in Poland? Uh, sorry, the question is what are the barriers? What are the, of... what are the barriers to growing sales, growing the market of, for chrysanthemums in the hypermarkets in Poland? Yeah, well, of of course, uh, for flowers in general, uh, it. The, the shelf life has to be really short because otherwise it doesn't look nice and uh, people won't buy. But I think if you really look at the consumer and not, of course the price has to be okay in the end. I know, but if you start with the price, you don't get the designs or the possibilities uh, with the flowers that, that are possible. So if you start with the design and making something uh, with a good shelf life uh, or, or fast, uh, fast moving uh, uh, flower uh, line, then I think uh, you get out one of the barriers. Uh. 
Okay, so shelf life is is really important uh, feature. For shelf life, oh, and it don't have, you have to make something that don't stay too long on the shelf, so that people want to buy it. Uh, yeah. Okay. So the fast turnover, and yeah. and that's connected with uh, price and location, I guess, within the store. Do, yes. do you find that uh, the retailers are uh, are good at recognizing the positions in the store where they can maximize the sales? Not always. <laughs> no, I think uh, we can win a lot uh, on that. Uh, because I guess they, it's uh, it has to be able to really prove its value as an item in the in the, yeah. on the shop floor, doesn't it, to get the, yes. the prime location, which will really drive uh, drive the sales. Yeah. And also to help to get it, uh, to, to improve the impulse uh, sales, then you also dependent on where the where the flowers are. Yeah, yeah. Um, I uh, I seem to have lost Becky, but I think uh, I have Carolien here, and I wonder if you have a view on the Polish retail consumers' perception on sustainability and how they see. Uh, sustainability is an important issue or not in in uh, in their purchases of flowers and plants uh thank you tim for the question and maybe first also for brigitte maybe nice to know that on the, on june 21st at the wholesale market here in bronicia in warsaw there will be a mini show for polish florists to uh, to promote the chrysanthemum as well uh, to oh. use as a flower so uh, maybe should be should you be a warsaw or any of the other chrysanthemum uh, growers or suppliers, it would be a nice opportunity maybe to come here. Yeah. Um, and for sustainability, at the moment, uh, I don't think it's still really an issue uh, for Polish uh, buyers of, of flowers. Um, I think as Brigitte was mentioning, it's more about shelf life um, and it's still very much about occasions, it's still very much about buying for your home. Uh, sustainability is not really in topic yet, although we can see some movement there and also during the exhibitions, there is more and more uh, focus on that team. Uh, for example, also when you look at the uh, the pots uh, for the for the plants, uh, where they are in to reduce the amount of plastic and also, for example, the uh, the wrapping of the flowers, that it's more with paper and not with plastic. But the growing of the flowers itself and sustainability is not really an issue yet in Poland. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, I think uh, Becky may be here, even though we can't see her on the on the video. Uh, oh, can you hear me, Becky? No, okay, she's not here. Um, I think. Uh, yeah. Okay, and what about, um, uh, I think it would be interesting to get uh, uh, Mr. Radkovic if he is uh, available and uh, also uh, Thomas Shekon. Ah, oh, Becky, you are here. Okay, that's good. Thank you for coming back. And I wonder no how uh, you are, how uh, with, you see the the risk of inflation, the pressure on household income. What what are you encouraging retailers and wholesalers and growers to do uh, to try to keep those sales up as the pressure on the spend uh, increases? Yeah, the the vendors and the retailers are really having um, a lot of talk and discussions on what's the best way to work through this inflationary period. So it's all about how you know to mitigate the impact on demand um, as prices go up. Certainly, there's a lot of um, stress now on the system based on the huge input costs that have certainly hit our flower industry. Uh, the big thing everyone's looking to see is how this inflation is going to hit impulse buys. Certainly, floral is considered an impulse buy. However, when we think about luxury items, um, people cut back maybe on dinners out or you know, expensive vacations or those type of things, where then flour becomes much more the affordable 
kind of luxury impulse buy. So certainly supermarkets are looking at what's the best way to make sure they mitigate um, the impact that inflation is going to have, but also being very sensitive to their vendors that are certainly experiencing uh, significant increased costs uh, to bring product to markets. Okay, thank you. And uh, I wonder if Agnieszka is there, whether we can put on a, a webcam, whether um, we can, thank, thank you. Whether, uh, do you have access to Mr. Radkovic? Uh, I don't have the, uh, any direct contact with him, but okay, I know okay. from both gentlemen that they are listening. So in case uh, there are some questions, I can pass them and we can answer those later on. And okay, so uh, I answer. would have a, a, a question also later uh, that we can maybe inform the audience of later uh, to ask him about how whether how he feels the economic pressures are affecting plant and garden sales in a garden centre and I think it's interesting the comment from Becky that sometimes you know the pressure the people will cut back in other areas but they maintain some of the lower cost luxuries in their lives and whether he feels that um, there's, there's a bit of a um, reduction in the you know there's not there's not the same pressure in our sector compared to many others um, anyway We'll pass that on to him. We can, uh, he can respond uh, at a later time. Um, so I, I think we need to come to a, a close. We have reached the end of our uh, session together. Um, I'd like to thank each of you uh, for supporting us with your presentations today and joining in the panel. Uh, thank you for um, sharing your experience and also I'd like to thank Mr. Radkovic and uh, Mr. Shekon as well for their sharing their expertise and knowledge of the Polish market and uh, we will uh, share questions with them. Any of the audience have questions for them please send them also and we will pass them on and get them back to you. The recording will be available to watch after this and you will be informed about that. And, and finally, I'd like to thank again the uh, Dutch Embassy in Warsaw for their support for um, uh, this uh, webinar. Thank you to René Schneiders, who so brilliantly operates the system on, uh, with Jungle Talks uh, in support of this. Thanks. Uh, and, and also to each of you, the panelists, all of you who have listened today, wish you a very happy day and uh, successful sales and business of flowers in Poland and around the world. Thank you very much, all of you. Thank <laughs> you.